Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin our formal program now. Thank you so much for indulging us on these few moments of delay. My name is Susan Forward, and I am the Acting Director for the Office of Policy in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. I'm pleased to be here today to present this wonderful program to you as the Mistress of Ceremony. Today we have as our opening speaker the Honorable John Tresvigna, who is the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, appointed by President Obama. He has held this post since the beginning in 2009, and we are very pleased to have him make the opening remarks. Mr. Tresvigna. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of HUD and the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, I welcome you to the Dr. Martin Luther King Memorial. We gather at this space today in solemn recognition and to give thanks. To give thanks to a man who devoted his life and paid the ultimate price at the hands of an assassin in order to allow others, all of us, to live free. In gathering here today, we recognize Dr. King's selfless acts of courage through nonviolence and celebrate, yes, celebrate the countless men and women before him and after him, including the employees of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and our brother and sister federal agencies who devote their efforts every day to better and fairer housing in America. 44 years ago today, Dr. King was marching for the rights of municipal workers in Memphis, Tennessee, speaking out against the war in Vietnam, supporting Cesar Chavez's efforts for agricultural workers in California. But the major action interrupted and left undone at the time of his death was the crusade to end housing discrimination in America. The campaign for fair housing had taken Dr. King not just across the South, but to Westchester County in 1964, and to the Great Chicago Campaign in 1966, and on to Washington, D.C. over and over again. Our America in 1968 was at risk of division between black and white, rich and poor, war and peace. But out of those difficult and dark times came an ennobling spirit of equality and justice for all. We brought fairness to the workplace with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, opened the ballot box to all citizens and ended the poll tax and literacy tests by virtue of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We raised the Statue of Liberty's lamp of freedom to people from all over the world through the 1965 Immigration Act, our international message of equality. And Head Start and Medicare established an abiding federal role for support for our children's education and our seniors' health and well-being. But it was the basic yet unattained principle that all Americans have a right to live where they choose and an expectation that their government will help them be lifted from poverty, lifted from segregation, and lifted from inequality that was Dr. King's unfinished business on April the 4th, 1968. And part of that agenda, part of ensuring all Americans the right to live where they choose, is the recognition of the role that governments, federal and local, have played in creating neighborhood inequality and the responsibility that governments, federal and local, now have in creating equal opportunity in every community. In the immediate aftermath of the assassination, our nation, its cities and its people, burned with rage, despair, and cynicism. President Johnson and his advisors immediately brought together spiritual leaders, union heads, mayors, black community leaders, educators, and others to determine what would bring the nation together and what would move the nation forward. The promise and commitment of fairer housing to go along with better housing was enacted just days later. Now, Dr. King would be the first to say that the Fair Housing Act was not enacted because of him or various senators 
or President Johnson. It was because of the people who struggled over the centuries to make this a better and fairer nation. It is upon those strong shoulders which we, have come, which we who have come of age and into positions of public service take up the struggle. We thank all of them for allowing us to update the words of the song made famous by Smokey Robinson and Dion. The song which asks, has anyone seen my old friend Martin? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seems the good they die young. I look around and he is us. 44 years later, this is our century. Fair housing is our goal and our mission. There is much more to be done. Just in the past two weeks, three of my FHEO colleagues at HUD headquarters have welcomed new babies into their families. Now we congratulate these colleagues and recognize that these, their, their children will turn 17 at the centennial of Dr. King's birth in the year 2029. Our work today is essential so that those children will benefit from open, integrated neighborhoods with quality, diverse schools. In 17 years, they and all their classmates in every neighborhood around the country must be ready for college and careers in a globalized world. We owe that much to our children and to the legacy of Dr. King. So we will lay a wreath this morning in tribute. And with all of you gathered here, continue on our mission to lay the groundwork for a nation and society truly worthy of Dr. King. Equal opportunity in every community in this land. Thank you. How beautiful and how very moving. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. It was a wonderful beginning of this fabulous day. Um, I'm now going to present the prayer of thanksgiving by Dr. Uh, Reverend Delton Nichols, who is our deputy director of the HUD Real Estate uh, Assessment Center. Okay, Mr. Douglas. Let us pray. Almighty God, we offer you thanksgiving and we offer you praise for the tremendous accomplishments that we as an agency and nation have made in fair housing and equal opportunity over the past 44 years. And though we are proud of our efforts to serve as a moral compass to point housing communities throughout the United States toward ending housing discrimination, and to raise the level of conscience of both individual landlords and the housing industry to embrace the principles of equal opportunity, we realize that there is still work that must be done as we celebrate our commitment to fair housing and equal opportunity with the same fervor and sense of urgency that the pioneers of this agency in our nation embraced 44 years ago as they took up the cause of eliminating housing discrimination that resulted in Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, the Fair Housing Act, grant us a renewed enthusiasm and a renewed purpose to not be satisfied until we create equal opportunity in every community, from the East Coast to the West Coast, from the Southern beaches to the northern borders. As we stand and sit in the shadows of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, let us never forget his fight against discrimination in general and housing discrimination in particular, and those who fought with him, who were dedicated and committed enough to pave a road toward fair housing when one did not exist. Let us forever hold our champions of fair housing and equal opportunity dear to our hearts as we are true to their purpose so that through our service and commitment to our country and its people and through our sense of decency and respect for human dignity for all Americans and out of a commitment to the cause of equality, liberty, equal opportunity and justice that we are still committed to removing barriers to making dreams come true and still committed to continue to fight and extinguish the isolated cinders 
of discrimination that still burn. So dear God, as we stand at this remarkable intersection in time, to recall when Martin Luther King Jr.'s life was taken from us, and when we gained the Fair Housing Act, and we look back over our shoulders and peer into our challenging past, and measure the distance from which we've come. Let us not lose sight of the giants of fair housing and equal opportunity who laid the foundation by service, advocacy, and sacrifice. Let us cherish their dreams that are still etched upon the canopy of time, and let us never ignore their voices that still echo through history. Let us give us a clear vision for the future that is strong enough to tilt the moral conscience of this nation toward that which is just, that which is fair, and that which is free of housing discrimination, so that we will know that, though the task of creating equal opportunity in every community may not be without challenge or opposition, that it will be a task through your blessing and our resolve that we shall accomplish. Hear our prayer. Oh God, amen. Thank you, Reverend Nichols. Thank you for that prayer of thanksgiving. And I wanna just take a moment to also thank uh, Mr. Harry E. Johnson, Sr., who is responsible for our being here today, who raised the funds for this beautiful memorial and who allowed us to celebrate this ceremony today for Dr. King and the passage of the Fair Housing Act on this site. So we thank you greatly, uh, Mr. Johnson, for this opportunity. With that, I'd also like to present our musical selection at this time, B.J. Douglas, Senior Project Officer for the HUD Center for Faith-Based and Community Initiatives.
that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, thank you so much. I now have the distinct honor and priv privilege of introducing to you Estelle Richmond, who is the deputy, acting deputy secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Ms. Richmond. Thanks all of you for joining us today. It is a real honor and privilege for me to be here with you at this wonderful ceremony and to share the stage with Dr. Clayton. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd also like to start by recognizing and thank John Trezvina, Brian Green, and BJ Douglas, um, and all the other remarkable fair housing champions who are lucky enough to have with us at HUD. But for all of the HUD family, I want to say thank you because of the work you do every day to provide quality, affordable housing to vulnerable families and help strengthen inclusive communities of opportunity and choice. You're not just honoring Dr. King's legacy, you're actually part of that legacy. And you're working to ensure that the families um, HUD serves can be part of it too. Whether or not we're investigating individual acts of housing discrimination, working to create oppor communities of opportunity in high poverty neighborhoods, or tackling issues of equity and access in the housing market, HUD is making a lasting contribution to the ideals of fair housing and opportunity for all. And 34 years after Dr. King's death, that contribution could not be more important or appropriate. Indeed, for those of you who are actually there, um, probably in front of a television set at that point in time, um, it was a shock. We all went into immediate, I cannot believe this is true. And as we continued to watch television that night, it became obvious that our grief that was so palpable. Because at that point, many of us thought that we had lost hope and that we, had, we would lose the ground that we had made and that symbol that we had in Dr. King would not be there any longer and we wouldn't be able to proceed. I think in the days and weeks that followed, one of the things we all learned and we all began to feel even more deeply is that he had changed all of us and that now we had something even more valuable. We had hope and we had commitment, and we had a reason to say, we are honoring him by continuing the fight in every way we could. And it has, and we've made great promise. For those of us, and at that point in time, I was a, a young 25, who had grown up in segregated schools in the South, who had um, lived in segregated housing, who had lived under the Jim Crow laws for so long, we can see that change. And maybe we aren't where we want to be and we continue that fight every day. We also can recognize how far we've come and how much has changed. And the world that our children and grandchildren live in now is definitely different than the world we grew up in. But we can never forget, and it's Dr. King's legacy to us, that says we can still do more, we have to do more, and we can make it better for not only our grandchildren, but for every generation to come. But as that tragic day was in Dr. King's memory and gift to all of us lives on, there's no better evidence of just how powerful that gift was than this beautiful ceremony that we're about to take part in. And that's why we need to make sure we're just not celebrating his memory but truly carrying forth his legacy. Of course, it's impossible to know exactly what Dr. King's message would be to us in 2012, but it's likely that he wouldn't want this moment to be all about remembering what he did in his life, but also about what we should do to celebrate the values he spent his life fighting for. Values like justice, peace, and service to one's fellow man. Indeed, as Dr. King himself once said, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? 
As President Obama said during the dedication of this memorial last October, that is why we honor this man, because he had faith in us. That is the spirit of Dr. King's life, memory, and enduring legacy. And that is the work that will bring us closer to Dr. King's vision of the beloved community. And those are the values I know all of you believe in and try to uphold in our work every day here at HUD. And that is why I am so proud to speak to all of you today. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Richmond. Thank you for those thoughtful and reflective remarks on Dr. King's legacy. And we appreciate your leadership at HUD as well. Thank you. Okay, I have an, another honor um, to introduce to you Mr. Ken Holbert, Special Assistant in the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, um, who has been with us perhaps as long as the Fair Housing Act <laughs> has been at HUD. And so we are honored to have him introduce our keynote speaker, Mr. Holbert. We are pleased to introduce Dr. Zerona Clayton of Atlanta, Georgia, president of the Trumpet Awards Foundation, and welcome her to the Department of Housing and Urban Development's 44th anniversary of the Federal Fair Housing Act as amended. We are indeed honored to have someone who has had such moving and prophetic experiences during the civil rights movement to join us to talk about that tumultuous period in the nation's history. Dr. Clayton was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma, and graduated from Tennessee State University in Nashville, Tennessee. She taught school in Chicago, Illinois, and Los Angeles, California. Prior to accepting a position in 1965 with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, where she worked closely with Dr. Martin Luther King Notably, a year after her arrival in Atlanta, she coordinated the efforts of Atlanta's black doctors to receive hospital privileges at all hospitals and all facilities in Atlanta. In recognition of the impact and the great health values associated with the desegregation of all hospital facilities, the National Medical Association, an organization of black doctors headquartered here in Washington, D.C., used the project as a model and guide for achieving desegregation of hospitals and facilities throughout the United States. Following Dr. King's assassination on April the 4th, 1968, President Lyndon Johnson urged the Congress to complete the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act as a tribute to the efforts by Dr. King to end racial discrimination in the marketing of residential real estate, which was so painful and destructive to family life as experienced by Afro-American and other minorities throughout the United States. Upon passage in April 11, 1968, the act was assigned to the Department of Housing and Urban Development for administration and enforcement. Many honors have been bestowed on Dr. Clayton. Among them are the first Coretta Scott King Award from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Madam C.J. Walker Award from Ebony Magazine for being one of the nation's outstanding women in marketing and communication, 
Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in offering a sincere welcome to a delightful lady, an outstanding leader, a stalwart of justice and freedom, Dr. Zenora Clayton. I'm too far away from that. Mm -hmm. okay. I like your introduction. Well, I... <laughs> Could you get the rest of it that I wrote for you? <laughs> there are several pages. Yeah. <laughs> and the plays would come over when you didn't hear the part that said, and she's young, sexy, and voluptuous. <laughs> Thank you so much, all you nice hut people, for this invitation. Uh, and it's so good to see my friend Harry, and I'm glad, uh, you know, we always introduce Harry, but we don't let him talk because he'll ask for some more money to finish his project. So, but Harry, we're grateful to you uh, for this moment and for this presence here, this absolutely marvelous. I want you all to meet my assistant. She makes about four or $500,000 a year. I think that's what I paid her, um, something like that. And maybe she said she wished I would, I don't know what, but I love with me, stand up, Maria. She goes every place with me because she protects her job. She doesn't want me to get away with paying her such a high salary. Um, I'm not going to call her your nice names because all of you all have just been wonderful. I just haven't had this kind of hospitality in a long time. Of course, at my age, I'm glad to be invited anywhere. Uh, a lot of people worry about age. I don't. Age is just a number. So I picked one. Uh, 31. 31, that's it. Now, I wrote some notes about Dr. King, but I'm not going to read them because I don't need to. I'm going to talk about this moment. Uh, but, you know, people change history to fit their own needs. And I tell my version of the history. Uh, my late husband was the one who um, worked with Dr. King on speech writing and preparation. And we were all together the night before the march on Washington working on the speech that we now everybody hears. And so I tell people now that I'm going to change history to my comfort. Um, they said that my husband wrote the speech. Martin Luther King said he wrote the speech. But since neither of them is here, I'm going to tell you, I wrote that speech. <laughs> so the last time I was here with Dr. King, we were here on this mall uh, with my speech. Uh, then here we are. Now, uh, today is special in lots of ways. I thank HUD for carrying out that mandate. Because you see, Harry tells me that millions of people come here to see this monument. But everybody wants now to be identified with Martin Luther King. Everybody marched with him. Everybody supported him financially. Everybody went to school with him, including women, and he went to an all-male school. <laughs> but we want the identity and the association. And one of my jobs at SCLC was to notify, especially celebrities, because we had learned that the presence of celebrities added to the aura of the fight we were waging, wherever it was, Birmingham, Montgomery, or wherever we were. And I remembered now, and I remembered and recalled it so vividly just after his death, when I was with Mrs. King in their home and people were coming from all over the world, of course, to visit her and to call on her. And some of those same celebrities came in with tears and warmth to embrace her. And I said, what well, you said, you kind of wink at the wall. Mm -hmm, you're not one of the ones who came when we called you when he was living. We call certain ones, but I want people to know that there were people like uh, Lena Horne and Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier and others who were there all the time, all the time when you needed. See, he doesn't know that you're here now today. But when we needed people to give support, there were many who were not there and they're coming now, um, perhaps singing his praises, well, rightfully so, his praises. 
But Harry, you'll have those millions who will come here. And they'll remember Dr. King and pick the parts of his life that they want to embrace. Just pick out that which suits them best. That's the sad part about where we are. The good part about where we are is that we will all remember this man in 39 years did more than some of us are doing it. Well, not me, I'm 31, but <laughs> in 40 and 50 years, we have to ask the questions, what have you done? People often ask me, what are we going to do now? Where's the next Martin Luther King? Well, suppose Martin Luther King had asked that. We're looking for somebody else. Why not you? There is something you can do. We still have hunger. And the Fair Housing Act was passed, but we still have people who said, not in my neighborhood. We still have those vestiges of discrimination that exist today. And we all take pride in the fact we've got a black man in the White House, but what does it mean if you still got bigotry out in the neighborhood. Bigotry and hatred and the segregated mentality existing in the neighborhoods. Dr. King said, until we change a man's heart, we'll never be able to change his behavior. We've got to change hearts today. 44 years later, change the heart. Remove and eradicate negative attitudes wherever they exist. We've got to learn to live together. And I drove Dr. King to the airport from Atlanta to Memphis. Talked to him on this day, April 4th. But on the road to the airport, we had just spent um, a day before we had spent at home uh, at his house, singing and playing and having a nice time. And Dr. King loved a good time. And people still marvel at the fact that he was really almost a comedian. I even said to him one time, when you solve all the problems of the world, you can go on stage and be uh, a comedian. Because he could loved, he loved to tell stories. And I have to tell this story about him. When I first met him, I knew him before moving to Atlanta, I'd met him in Los Angeles, in Chicago, in New York, and he was treated like the celebrity he was. I mean, limousines and security and suites in the hotel and everybody's tugging on his him. So he was the real celebrity. So I came to Atlanta the first time and my husband and I were to meet him um, after church. He was preaching that Sunday and we were all going out to dinner, the four of us to dinner. So he just said, just meet me outside the church. They had a spot there um, that was reserved for the pastor. So we just kind of stood there waiting for him to come back out of the office. Well, I had not noticed particularly the cars parked. But not to, in case any of you drive a Nash Rambler, uh, this was the car we got in. And when he came down, he got in the driver's side. And I was kind of surprised because somehow I didn't think Dr. King even knew how to drive. I'd always seen him in the limousines, you know, being chauffeured around. So he got in the driver's side. It was a bright, sunshiny day. So my husband and I got in the back, and Mrs. King and he were in the front. And now we were at the beginning of the street there, so we were on the corner. But as soon as he turned the ignition on, the windshield wipers began to go. And I just thought he pushed the button inadvertently, the wrong one. But now he's keep continue to go, and we back around the street, the corner. And you know, after a while, you're trying to be a nice visitor, but I just had to say, Dr. King, why are we going in reverse? <laughs> and why are the windshield wipers going? So he said, oh, no reason particularly. He said, but the car doesn't warm up until we go about a block. <laughs> so now we go the block with the windshield wipers going, and sure enough, we got a distance a block, and he stopped and then put it back and forward. We'll move forward, the windshield wiper ceased, and now we're going forward. I said, oh, wait till I tell the nation about this. <laughs> they thought he was a big shot, he wasn't at home. I told Harry when you first started this project, I said, if 
it's a good thing Dr. King is not here because if he were, he said no to this. The man did not want any attention on him. An unselfish man, a man who wanted everything for somebody else and for his cause and for his mission. And if you remember reading, when he got the Nobel Peace Prize and got a cash award accompanied with it, he gave it all away. Because he said, it's not for me. It's for the work we are trying to do. The man practiced what he preached. And that's atypical in today's world. We do a lot of preachments, but not comparable to our practice. So on April 4th, we remember his life. And thanks to Harry and all the people around this world who contributed to this monument, we have a man who only lived 39 years, but died on this date. But through this monument and his life, he still lives. But we can pattern after him, pattern the work he did while he was here. And as I was saying on the way to the airport, we remembered the fun we had on the day at the office, I mean, his home. And his mother called me late that night to say, I know you're going to drive Martin to the, to the airport tomorrow, but will you tell him that I'd sure like to have more days like we had today. We were singing and playing the piano and having a good time. And although I'm his mother, I understand he's busy. But tell him next time, you know, try to plan a few more moments for us to have those fun times. So on the way to the airport, people often ask me, what did you all talk about on that last day? Because I was the last one to see him in Atlanta. I said, your mother called. And I told him the story. So on April 4th, about 3.30 in the afternoon, Atlanta time, he called his mother. The first time he'd done that, because you know how mothers are. Those of you who are mothers, you understand. So she wasn't mad at him. She just was jealous for the moment that she could savor more of these kinds of days like they'd had that Sunday afternoon. She said, when I saw her later that night after the tragic news had been confirmed. She said, when I have these, the pain of this grief subsides, I want to just let you know that I'll be grateful to you eternally because I felt like I was one of the last persons to whom he spoke because it was about five something Atlanta time that we got the news of his death. But people will come here and pick the parts. And what I remember when we were going to the airport, he used to tease me about not marching. You see, I had to help work up the marches, did all the grunge work, but I never marched. And he said to me, aren't you going to march? I said, no, not today. I'll march next time. And he said, why aren't you marching today? I said, well, Every time you all march, they throw you in jail. <laughs> and I heard they don't have no room service in jail. So I don't want to go. And I said, next time. And I did that every time. Didn't have no tennis shoes. I gave an excuse. Oh, I don't have tennis shoes. Even we can get you some. I said, well, next time you can get them. <laughs> well, I never marched. And I can say that. You know, everybody says they did, and they didn't. I didn't, and I can tell you I didn't. But. When he got to the airport, he said, and by the way, when are you going to march? Because he was discussing the march that he was going to Memphis for. And I said, well, Dr. King, you know, the marches are designed to make change. And I felt like I broke the barrier in television because I was the first black person to have my own television show in the whole South. I broke that barrier. Thank you very much. I had changed the heart or credited with, I didn't know that until I was credited by the man himself, the grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, got out of the Klan and credited me with changing his negative attitude, which made international story. 
And then I said to him, I've been doing some things that I think in my own way have to make change. So in a sense, I have been marching all the time. And I wrote that as my title for the article I wrote about him. He still lives in our hearts. And he said to us that blacks and whites must learn to live together. We've got to embrace each other because we're so interconnected one to the other. And I said to, the, to you as my parting words to tag on to his great profound words, we absolutely must. That our society depends on each of us to do what we can to make the change, to make a better world for us all and for our generations coming after us. And I remember the man who went out to play some golf. He put the ball on the tee, took a full swing, hoping, of course, to hit the ball. Instead, he hit a hill of red ants. He was not dismayed by that, took another swing, hoping to hit the ball, and instead hit the hill of red ants. This repeated itself until it got down to the two remaining ants. This one ant said to the other ant, if we're going to survive, we better get on the ball. That's my message to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. It is difficult for me to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Clayton because words seem to pale to the many things she's done in her life. This is so much, there is so much that I would like to publicly say to Dr. Clayton, but I'm overwhelmed by the realization that I'm standing in the presence of greatness. What you may not know is that Dr. Clayton accepted our invitation without hesitation. We told her we were planning a wreath laying ceremony for the MLK Memorial on the very day he was assassinated 44 years ago. And her response was simple. Yes, I will do it. You will never know how much it meant to me to have you here today. I'm honored to thank you for making time in your very demanding schedule to travel to DC from Atlanta, Georgia for our Fair Housing Month events. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank you for being a trailblazer for all women, especially women of color. Your unyielding commitment to equality and justice furthers my passion for what we do every day to fight for fair housing and equal opportunity. I need to tell you that if it wasn't for you and your work, I might not be standing here today. If you chose a different path, one where you didn't serve as a tester for employment discriminatory practices, I might not be employed with the federal government. If you did not fight for equal treatment in the school system, I might not have a law degree from Indiana University. If you did not fight for integrated hospitals, my daughter would not be a patient at National Medical Center here in DC where she receives excellent medical care. Thank you. Oops. Well, I can just speak from the heart. You are a soldier for justice and equality. And your presence here is both moving and inspirational. You are more than just Dr. Zernona Clayton, the founder and CEO of the Trumpet Awards. To me, you are my shero, and I thank you for being here. So very, very beautiful. Thank you, Deandra. Very heartfelt. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. I'm now going to uh, introduce again uh, the musical selection with B.J. Douglas uh, for performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
incredible. We have such talented HUD. Who knew? <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you, BJ. Um, for our closing remarks, I'm going to invite uh, John Trezvina, our Assistant Secretary, our leader in the fight for fair housing, our incredible leader, and for making this day happen for us today. So, Mr. Trezvina. Thank you, Susan, and, and, and thank you, everyone. Uh, part of my role here is to uh, thank the committee, but there's 13 people on the committee, and I don't like 13. So I will, uh, I will not thank you, Ken Holbert. Uh, <laughs> so in order to make it 12, but I do want to note, uh, as, as Dr. Clayton talked about some of her personal experiences w w with Dr. Dr. King, and we, that, that is correct. We all, those of us, uh, probably most of us, never obviously knew him a, as a person. Uh, Mr. Holbert, though, uh, told me one day about his time playing pool with Dr. King. So Mr. Holbert is both uh, a, a bridging those days to today and into the future but also from a personal level uh, there, as well as an institution and a tremendous, uh, tremendous leader in fair housing for many, many years. I want to thank you for that. Uh, but for today's, uh, for today's uh, ceremonies, uh, I want to thank our committee. There's a tremendous, tremendous work. Kathy Bowie, uh, Tamara Broden, uh, Laura Cooper, uh, Deandra, who you've heard from, uh, Persis Clinton, uh, Francine Cunningham, who you all emailed uh, to get here, uh, Elena Hayona from the OPA press office, as well as Shante Goodlow, uh, Victor Lambert from our own press office and within FHEO, uh, Adrian Lewis, who's played a, an instrumental role in making all of this possible, Milton Turner, and of course uh, Bob Walker. Uh, necessarily, because of the, this, the uh, focus on Dr. King, this has been necessarily a focus on the past, where we have, where we have come from. Uh, and, and it is appropriate for that for this morning as we go into the wreath uh, laying ceremony itself. This afternoon, this afternoon at 2 o'clock at the Brook Mondale Auditorium, we will be focused on the present and, and the future. The continued work as an inclusive America of uh, ending discrimination in race, religion, national origin, and color, and expansion of the Fair Housing Act to include women, to include people with disabilities, uh, to include uh, families with children. And in the 21st century, uh, to make sure that all our HUD programs are open to all people, equal access to all families, uh, irrespective of uh, uh, being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or, tr or transgender. That is our mission today. So this afternoon, we'll, we will be focused on our mission going forward into the future. We'll be joined by Delegate uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton from the District of Columbia, as well as Ruth Martin, one of our partners in, in uh, lending uh, the discrimination battles. Uh, she is with, with Moms R Rising uh, organization. Uh, and finally, uh, let, me, let me just say, as, as we uh, move from the uh, celebrating and honoring uh, our heroes of the past and, the, and their guidance into the future, I would be remiss without uh, remembering John Payton. Uh, John Payton uh, passed away last month, uh, the president and general counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. When I was president of MALDEF, he was a tremendous partner to me in our works together. Uh, but for all of us, all of us, whether we are lawyers, advocates, or members of communities, we owe great debt, to, great debt of gratitude to John Payton as well. I thank you all for coming. I, and I'm going to turn this back over to Susan because uh, in terms of our next logistics with, with the wreath, uh, but this is a very memorable uh, ceremony for, for me, uh, and I appreciate all of the hard work that's gone into this. But your presence, not, not only your presence here honoring Dr. King, but your presence together with Fair Housing and with HUD uh, to make this a better and fairer nation. Thank you all very, very much.